If you have your Bibles or Testaments with you, we're turning to God's Word, and we're turning to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and then we're going to Matthew's Gospel chapter 24 for some verses. 1 Thessalonians and the chapter 4. you haven't the Word of God, just listen to the Word as we read. And remember that it is God's Word. It's not the Word of a denomination or the Word of a man. And what I am preaching are not my views, but are what is, I believe to be what the Word of God tells us. And that's all we're concerned about in these meetings. And I would suggest that there's some of you here uh, and will be here if God tarries and you haven't heard much preaching on the Lord's return. And while it's one of the great doctrines of Scripture, it seems to be that there's so much controversy and different viewpoints uh, that people are not taking it up in these days when it should be. It's a ploy of the devil. I know of no doctrine in Scripture more motivational to keep the saints clean and moving for God than the doctrine of the Lord soon return. And God forgive us for our lack of of knowledge regarding it and the lack of preaching upon it in our land. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13. The Apostle Paul's writing here and he says in verse 13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. And that word sleep is used many times for death in the Word of God. You see, there were people, uh, some of the Christians in these days uh, had loved ones died and they thought that they'd never see them again. And they'd heard the preaching of the resurrection and people were going about saying there's no resurrection and when you die, you're like a dog and you lie there and that's all it's about. And Paul puts this, puts this right to them here. He corrects them and he encourages them. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them loved ones of yours which have died. That ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive, and that includes us, the Christians, the believers, and remain unto the coming of the Lord, he hasn't come yet, shall not proceed, prevent or proceed them which are asleep, We'll not go a time, any time, a long time or time before them. We'll go at the same time as them. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together, together, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore comfort one another with these words. That's great comfort. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them 
as travail upon a woman with child. And only women that give birth know what that means. And they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. And note the word thief. We're turning back to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24. And the verse 36, our Lord Jesus speaking, this great 24th chapter, read it every day. And read it with your newspaper and your news bulletins before you. For the Lord Jesus here is prophesying one of the great prophetic chapters of the Word of God. Matthew 24 and verse 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and given in marriage, there's nothing wrong with any of those things, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken and the other left. Watch, therefore, therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man, the head of, the father of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. We'll end the reading there, and we know that God will bless to us. He has promised the reading of his word. Let us bow in a moment's prayer, please. Father, we give you thanks tonight for what we have been singing. We thank you tonight for the messages and song. We thank thee for your precious word, the living word of God that has been read in our midst. And our Father, as we come now to declare truth, we pray for the help and the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit to be upon us. We pray that thou will grip men and women tonight, that they might fasten their gaze upon thee, and that they might flee from the wrath that surely comes. Lord, have mercy upon us, and stir up thy people to be awake in these days, and that we might redeem the time as the days are evil. Help us now, we pray, for Christ's sake. Amen and amen. In the bad winter of 2010, I was looking out of our kitchen window one morning, and I noticed an accumulation of... Uh, empty crisp bags, cigarette packages, bottles, Chinese cartons, and other miscellaneous pieces of refuse. Mrs. Johnson saw them too, <laughs> and she said it's time that they were lifted. I said I'll lift them when Monday comes. Monday's a great day for me to do things, and very seldom much is done on Monday either. 
But within a few hours there came a fall of snow. And there was no more talk about the crisp bags or the bottles, for we couldn't see them. And hidden underneath the snow they lay until the thaw came. And whenever the thaw set in, the wind and the rain came, and as I looked out, when all the snow and ice were gone, my problem was still there, and it was even worse. So what happened was this. The snow and the wind and the rain are all belonging to the same family. All of the same nature. And as they descended upon my garden, every one of them moved away, but my refuse was still left. They came for their own nature. They disappeared and left was the rubbish. And my dear friend, it's going to be like that. In a moment in the twinkling of an eye, when Jesus Christ comes, those of the divine nature, those that are born again by the Spirit of God, those that belong to Christ, in the twinkling of an eye, in a split second, they're going to be taken up and taken out of this world. And those that are not, and I am not calling you refuse tonight, and I'm not calling you rubbish tonight, because no man is rubbish in the sight of God. We're all precious souls from whom Christ died for. But some of these days he's going to burst the clouds and he's, he's going to come again and he's going to take the church out. In a split second, he's going to take us out. And those that are saved and born again will go with him. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Those which are alive and remain, we shall all be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air and you will be left behind. That's what these meetings are about. And I appeal to you tonight, if you're not saved, that you will take heed to what I'm going to say to you. All the rubbish was cast, will be cast into the incinerator and into the fire, and it will be burnt up. And my friend, that's what's going to happen to men and women without Christ. There's an eternal fire. And I want to warn you about that fire in these nights. Is coming. And maybe you're here tonight and you're hiding under some ice or snow of hypocrisy. Maybe you're here tonight and you have a hat and you have a Bible and you have all the rest of it, but you're no more saved than this pulpit saved. You're not going anywhere. You're not going, my friend. Nothing that defileth shall enter God's heaven. And we will never get in there with our sin. And maybe I'm speaking to some young person tonight and you're hiding in the pew or hiding between your mother and father or hiding in a Christian home under the snow and under the ice. But remember, it's going to go. It's going to go. And you will be exposed. Just as the litter in my garden was exposed. And I say to you tonight, seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he is near. Turn while the Savior and mercy is waiting and steer for the harbor light. 
He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whoever so confesseth and forsaketh it shall find mercy. Be sure your sin will find you out. I trust, sinner, tonight that you will trust Christ. Now, the two main fundamental reasons that I'm taking up these subjects and we have hired this school is to preach the message of the last days and the coming of the Lord so that sinners may be saved. I'm not here to put forward my viewpoint on eschatology. Nor am I here to put forward the lifeboat or anybody else's. My main reason to preach these messages is that sinners might be saved and that they would come to Christ and that they'll not be left behind when Jesus comes and he could come at any moment. And the second reason I am preaching it is for the sanctification of saints, that they might be set ablaze for God, and that they might be as the bride of Christ should be when the bridegroom comes, clean and pure and holy and ready. I'm not taking up these meetings to inform, to inform you of what I know, for I know nothing. I'm not taking these meetings up that you might be informed. I'm taking them up, believer, that you, could, that you should be more conformed to his image. That when he shall appear, John says, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And as many hope in him, that, that, as many as hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. These messages should keep you pure. These messages should keep you clean. These messages, believers, should keep you and me that we're watching every moment for his coming. Tell me if he'd have came last night, where would he have got you? Come on now. Watching some pornography maybe on television. Watching some old soap. As John Moxon says, the soaps are for the bathroom. Come on now, if we were to burst the clouds yesterday, that Friday night, Thursday night, yesterday morning, if we were to burst it this morning when you should have been in the house of God. Because it's going to be so sudden, so quick, so powerful, that there'll be no excuses and there'll be no time. That's the reason we're taking them up. Martin Luther says this, we need to live as if he died this morning, he rose again this afternoon, and he's coming again tonight. And I say to believers tonight that's listening to me, and this is going out on the internet, and I know that, and I'm conscious of that. And I say to every believer tonight, settle your differences. Keep close accounts. Keep clean. Pray up, pay up, stand up, own up, pack up, for we're going up, and we're going soon. Don't ask what the world is coming to. Ask where the world is going. What's going to happen next is the question being asked in the streets, in the shops, in the offices, in the factories, on the farms, and in the school. And everybody believes, everybody believes, oh, many, I've asked on save people tonight, they believe something big is going to happen. Something big is going to happen. Wake up! Forty-seven Muslim terrorist groups. It's not just Al-Qaeda and ISIS. There's 47 terrorist Muslim groups watching their opportunity and they're all pinpointing Israel, United States of America, Great Britain, and believers. Forty-seven of them. Like them boys was in Paris. Something big is going to happen. Tell me what's going to happen next. I don't know what's going to happen next in the world. I don't know when the next plane will fall out of the sky. I don't know when the next tsunami will come. I don't know next, next when the brutal murders will come from these men. 
But I know what the Bible tells me. And I know what this Word of God tells me. This Word of God tells me what's going to happen for the next 1,007 years. 1,007 years. And if you want to know where I get my mathematics from in the 1,007 years, you come and see me. And anything that I say, I can back it up with Scripture. And if anybody wants to come and talk to me about it, you're welcome. Do you know that we have 1,007 years from the moment the church goes? And there's not one prophecy to be fulfilled before Jesus Christ takes his people out, but you wouldn't think that. So what's going to happen next as far as the Bible is concerned? Well, what's going to happen next as far as the Bible is concerned is the evacuation of all saints across the world. If you don't agree with that, then you show me why you don't agree with it. Tell me what the Bible says. Tell me what you believe. It's going to be the evacuation, the mass evacuation of every saint born again across the world from every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue. Going to be the greatest exodus ever known. Journalists have already planned to call it the missing millions. I call it the great escape. For we're going to escape the wrath that's coming. It's bad enough as it is. Bad enough to try to bring up your children in these days. But it's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. Every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue. Paul says it'll be like the twinkling of an eye. Jesus says it'll be like a crack of lightning from the east to the west and a number of twice he says it'll be like a thief in the night and as we come to an end I'll show you what he meant. But he says it'll be like the lightning cracking from the east to the west. Now meteorologists tell us when the lightning strikes from the east to the west the storm's over. And I praise God for that for the storm's going to be over. It's going to be over for the believer. There'll be no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more tears, no more death, no more cancer, no more coronaries, no more gravesides laying a wife or a husband in the grave. No more of that. The storm will be over when Jesus comes. So the first thing there's going to be, there's going to be a mass evacuation. Secondly, there's going to be an evaluation. Because you know, friends, and we're taking this night after night and we'll be dealing with the Antichrist and we'll be dealing with the, with the tribulation and we'll be dealing with Armageddon and we'll be dealing with the things that God chose us to do. But you know, the very first thing is the evacuation of every sin. Not one scripture to be fulfilled. Show me. This is the only generation that could say that. And after that, there's going to be the evaluation. For once the, once the saints go, we're going to go to the judgment seat of Christ. And our life from the moment we were saved is going to be evaluated. We'll have to give an account for everything that we've done and the things that we left undone. I live in the conscious sense of that every day, and my wife can tell you that. That one day I'm going to have to give an account for my call, for my ministry. I'm going to have to give an account for my time and my ties and my talents. And so are you. Because the rapture could happen now. The rapture's not mentioned the name in the Bible. Haphazard all that takes you out just catches you away. And I could spend two hours showing you it. And the moment that happens, we're in at the judgment seat of Christ. Not for our sin. Our sins were dealt with at Calvary, but for our service. How are you serving him tonight? How are you living for him tonight? Are you doing what he called you supposed to do? Are you obedient to him tonight? Evacuation. 
evaluation, celebration, the marriage supper of the Lamb, when the bridegroom will meet with it with the bride, and they'll all be, we'll all be all round the banqueting table forever. Then there's the coronation. You know, there's five crowns in Scripture for believers. Do you know anything about them? Do you know where they are in Scripture? Do you read about them? There are five crowns for believers. And you know, Jesus says, let no man take your crown. I believe that there'll be saints of God in the glory, and some man will be wearing the crown that they should have had. I don't want anybody to wear my crown. Wearing your crown. The day that God called you and told you to go somewhere, to do something, to win that soul, to forsake all and follow him, and you never done it. You were disobedient to him, and you continue to disobey him. You're going to be caught out some of these days, let me tell you. Oh, friends, this is serious. And I'll tell you very few in Northern Ireland, if there's any, that'll wear the martyr's crown. You get the crown. You look at the five crowns. There's a martyr's crown. Do you know that there was 100,000 people martyred for Christ in the last 12 months? 100,000 heads taken off, crucified, burnt in Syria, in Iran, in Vietnam. 100,000 in 12 months. And we can't leave the fire even to go to a meeting. We're hearing about that this morning. Are we real or are we not? We can sing all these hymns about crowns and glory and all the rest, but I wonder how many's going tonight. I wonder if Christ was to come tonight, how many'd be still in these chairs. There's going to be an evacuation, evaluation, celebration, coronation, and when immediately the church goes, there's going to be the tribulation, what my Bible tells me. The moment the saints go, the Spirit goes, and all hell's going to break loose. My, these are the birth pangs. My friend, we think it's bad at the moment, but it can't, it, it's going to go worse and worse and worse. But once the church goes, once the salt and the light goes, once the restraining power goes, it's the restraining power that's holding back. The pot's boiling tonight. But God's keeping the lid of it because of the saints of God praying and crying. But once they're taken out, all hell's going to break loose. All hell. Oh, we think it's bad. Let me tell you that I just, I just was informed there the other day and I believe that God's keeping the lid on these things. There's many things that the devil and these crowds are trying to do and others are trying to do and governments are trying to do. And Cameron and Clegg's trying to do. But they can't, they're restrained to a certain, a, a certain extent. They're, they're restrained. I, I heard the other day that there was a couple of hundred men lined up in Syria and in some of those other countries are lined up and they're trying to catch the disease Ebola. And they're planning to get infected with Ebola and come over a couple of hundred of them into the United States of America and into Britain and destroy the country. That's radical. The tribulation's coming. The evacuation, the tribulation and the revelation. Now, don't get the two comings of the Lord mixed up because he's coming to the air and then he's coming to the earth. And there's seven years in between the two. And three years of it, the last three and a half years is the awful, awful tribulation when all these bowls and all these curses and all these things in Revelation 5 and on would be opened out. We'll deal with some of them some night. But this world's gone into an awful state. 
And the Antichrist shall rise. And then Jesus Christ is coming to the, he's coming to the earth to reign. And he's coming with his saints. And I'll give you the scripture for them. Revelation chapter 1, Colossians chapter 3. I'll give you scripture for every one of these things that we have mentioned tonight. And I'll go through them with you if you want. During the last half of the seven years is the, is the great tribulation, the wrath of God. And after the evacuation of believers, the tribulation in the world and the revelation of Christ and his saints when they come to earth to reign, hallelujah, he's going to reign for a thousand years. And he's going to reign just as it was before Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden. And the dog shall not bark, and the lion shall lie down with the lamb, and the little child will put her hand into the wasp's nest, and will not be stung, because the curse will be removed. And Jesus shall reign where'er the sun does his successive journeys run. And he'll show them how it should have been done. And oh, what thrilling stuff that is. And after that, let me give you another thing that's going to happen. You want to know what's going to happen in the thousand and seven years? After the evacuation is the tribulation. After the tribulation is the revelation of Christ. After the revelation of Christ is the humiliation of the devil. What do you mean the humiliation of the devil? Well, Revelation 20 and verse 2 tells me that one angel with one chain in one minute He's going to bind Satan and cast him into the bottomless pit. He's going to be humiliated. One angel, it's only going to take one angel. And the powers of hell is let loose upon us tonight across our land. But remember this, Satan's defeated. And he was defeated at Calvary. He can handle most things, but he can't handle the blood. He can handle you and he can handle me, but he can't handle the blood. Hallelujah for the blood. I hope you're under the blood tonight. One angel with one chain in one moment, he's going to cast the devil into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. So there's this humiliation and there's this incarc incarceration. For, for a thousand years he'll be bound. The devil's not the boss, you know. He's the God of this world. But he's under the control of my Lord, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And he's going to put him under his feet. The devil's always under the feet of my Savior. Always under his feet. Whenever Jesus comes to the air, he'll come to the earth in the form of Antichrist. When Jesus comes to the earth, he'll put him down again into the bottomless pit. He's always under his feet. He's defeated. He's a liar and the father of lies. And he's telling you tonight that you can't be saved. And he's telling you tonight this man's preaching a lot of nonsense. He's telling you tonight, I, just go, I don't believe that the Lord's coming. I believe that we're all going to go through the tribulation. And it doesn't matter. He's not going to come soon. And it doesn't matter what we do. Do you know why you believe that? Because you don't want to get, you don't want to get real. See, this is a great doctrine, those sort of things, to, to, to just lie back and do nothing. Never go to a prayer meeting. Never give out a track. And believe that he's going to come sometime, but he's going to come and he's going to, only going to be one coming. He's going to take us all away and everything's going to be all right. And no matter what we do, my friend, is a lie from hell. And I challenge you tonight to read the word. Jesus is going to burst the clouds and he's going to come again and we're going to cut out. Why has he told us to what? watch, watch, watch and be ready, be ready. For this very reason, my friend, that we'll not know when he's coming. And last of all, when all those things, the last thing to happen is the destruction of the sinner, the great white throne. And we're going to preach a whole night on it. 
because all that are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. And whether you're cremated and scattered across some river or mountain doesn't make anything to God. He that brought us from ashes will bring us again from dust. From dust he'll bring us again from ashes. You can't hide from God. You can't go under the snow. The snow will go away. The uncovering will be there. You'll be seen. You'll be out in the open. You can't hide from God, sir. Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And the graves shall open and every man and woman will come forth and the sea will give up their dead and them that are in it. Stand at the great white throne and the book shall be opened. And whosoever name was not found in the book of life I tell you, if your name's not there, you'll not put it there then. There'll be no barrister to defend you then. There'll be no lies in court that day. And whosoever name was not found written in the book of life was cast. Cast. Ever watch a fisherman? Cast into the lake of fire. Bad enough of it was fire, but a lake of it. Every Christ rejecter will go there from Adam. It's awful to think that some of you will go out of Christian homes round and again. It's awful to think that you'll go out of the province of, of Ulster with all its meetings and books and tapes and DVDs and gospel and tracts, God help us, and go to hell. Fasten your eyes as we close in a moment at Matthew 24 and verse 42. Here's the Lord Jesus saying, so they're not my words, they're his. Watch, therefore. Therefore, not just because what I have said to you, but what he says. Watch, therefore, therefore is two, twice in these verses, and that means what has gone on before. Well, you read Matthew 24 right up to then, and you'll see what has gone on before. Therefore, as it was in the days of Lot, as it was in the days of Noah, two shall be in, be- two shall be in, the, in the factory, two shall be in the field, one shall be taken, as a- therefore, because of that, as it was in the days of Lot and Noah, He emphasizes that, didn't we read that? That's not only because of the ungodliness in Lot and Noah's day. And there were ungodly days, just like they are today, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the... But what he says here, they did eat, they drink, they married, they were given in marriage. It wasn't the fact of their ungodliness, it was the, the fact of their unexpectedness. They were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were given in marriage. And they laughed at Noah, and they mocked at Noah. Just the same as some will do with this message. I'm quite quite convinced of that, but that doesn't concern me one bit. Not a bit. They laughed at that. The scoffers in the last days will rise up. They went on eating, they went on drinking, they went on enjoying themselves, they went on selling, they went on buying, they went on building, they went on doing what we are doing, what you'll be doing tomorrow. That's not the fact. The fact, the point is this, my friend, you'll do it without a thought. There's nothing wrong with you going out to buy something tomorrow. There's nothing wrong with you taking your supper tonight. There's nobody saying that, and the Lord's not saying that, but he's saying, listen, he says, watch. Watch. That word watch means wake up. Stir yourself. Why? Because he's going to come, how? As a thief. The Lord Jesus Christ is not likening himself to a thief. 
literally, but a thief symbolically. I can tell you, my friend, I can tell you some more, more, some things more about thieves than, than most of you. And the thief comes to the darkest side of the house and things are dark. It's night. It's referred to as night. He'll not go in in the middle of broad daylight. No, no. And I'll tell you, he doesn't come for any old thing, the professional thief either. Not coming for the dishcloth. He's coming for the jewels. He's coming for that which is precious. He's coming for his own. That he has redeemed that Calvary and bought with such an awful price. He's going to make up his jewels. Oh, he's coming for his own. Any sensible, sober thief will not send a message to the householder that he's coming. That's what Jesus is saying. He's not going to send word to him that I'm going to burgle or I'm going to rob. He's not going to say that I'm coming at a certain day or at a certain moment or at a certain hour. Sure, he'd be a fool. And I tell you who would be a fool as well, the head of the house. Jesus says, the good, the good man of the house, the father of the house, you the good man of the house tonight listening to me. Are you any concerned about your house and your family? That's what he's saying. A father, or the head of the house, or as Jesus puts it, just the good man of the house. Because, my new men, you have a responsibility in your house. Wouldn't, you be, wouldn't that man be a fool if he'd take his wife and his children out to a restaurant to eat and to drink, knowing, knowing, that's what Jesus is, knowing that the thief was going to come to break up. It says break up the house. So he's using violence, this thief. That's what it says. Sure, wouldn't he be a fool? Sure, the man wouldn't be wise that would sit eating and drinking knowing that at that very minute the thief was breaking into his house to take all his precious stuff, all his wife's jewellery, all the heirlooms, all the, all the things, all the electrical stuff, all the stuff that they built up, and he's just sitting eating and drinking, and he's not passing a bit of remarks. He's doing it because he doesn't know. Do you not know tonight? Well, I tell you, you do know tonight. Mother, you do know tonight. And there's not a person in this meeting who doesn't know tonight that Jesus is coming. And he's coming soon. Don't you? Don't you, sir? Father, don't you know tonight? Well, then what about your children? What about your family? Have you no concern for them? Hmm? No concern at all for them? You're away to your work tomorrow and you're eating and you're drinking and you're buying and you're selling and your children go to hell. And you say, I believe Jesus is coming. And I, and I tell you, if we believe this, We'd be crying to God all night in this place. So what sort of a fool would this be? Do you remember the jailer as it closed? Do you remember the Philippian jailer? Well, he was, a, he was, he was the prison officer in charge of the jail at Philippi. And his family lived in the prison with him in married quarters. Read Acts 16. 
and he whipped and scourged Paul and Silas and put them into the fast, fastened them way down in the lower dungeon, and he went to bed. He hadn't a care, not a thought. He went to bed and he went to sleep. You go to bed and you go to sleep, my friend, and you never think of these things. You never think that 10,000 things could happen during the night in that body of yours that you know nothing about and you're out into eternity. And you sleep and you're not ready. And he went to bed and he went to sleep and Saul and Silas praised and the prayed and the prisoners heard them. He didn't hear them, the prisoners heard them. Read your Bible. And at midnight there was an earthquake and the place shook and the boy jumped up and the life was scared out of him. And here's what it says. Supposing the prisoners had escaped, he was going to commit suicide. He says, supposing the prisoners had escaped. If these prisoners get away, my job's on the block. My head's on the block. If these prisoners get away, I'm in charge of the prison. If they're gone, I'm going to commit suicide. He hadn't one thought for his family. Do you see, do you you read anything about him, cared about his wife and family? Because they were there. Is that you, Father? Is that you? You're so concerned with what the boss would think, or what people would say. Is that you? You see, here we have, as I close tonight, we have the unexpectedness and we have the unpreparedness. The father, the head of the house, he was not prepared. And if you like the shock of it, it's going to be an awful shock, I tell you, if Jesus were to come now. You think of a mother. You think of a pregnant mother. And two children. And suddenly he bursts the clouds and he comes again. The children away. The, pre- the, the, the child out of the womb or the twins out of the womb is gone and the mother's left. It'll be awful. What a shock. In my last profession. I got a phone call one day to come out to Tully Goonigan. There was a woman on the phone and she was frantic. And I came out and I met with this lovely young woman and her husband that just come back within an hour of their honeymoon. And very foolishly, every present they had as well as all their own stuff They left it in a wee bungalow where they were going to live. And her father was to look after it. Now, I don't know whether he was faithful to what he said he would do or not. I can't remember. But when they turned the key in the door and went in, everything was gone. Everything. The thief had come. And those were only material things, my friend. And you'll turn the key in the door someday and the children will be gone and your husband will be gone. Watch, therefore. Jesus says, therefore. Watch, wake, be vigilant, take heed, for he'll come as a thief with speed. In the night. I preached one night on a Syrian ready to perish. But I tell you in closing tonight, there's a Savior ready to pardon. Be ye also ready. For ye know not the day or the hour that the Son of Man cometh. Are you ready tonight?
you can get ready. I can help you to get ready. Others can help you to get ready. You can be prepared tonight. You can go home tonight and go to bed and go to sleep and not, not concerned if Jesus were to come and leave you behind. Friend, don't, don't do that. For I believe the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. I feel it in my heart. That he could well come before these meetings are over. We didn't call these meetings to fool about. We called them to preach the truth and warn men and women of what Jesus said. Let us pray. Our time is gone. Just let us pause in a moment's prayer and reflection of what we've heard. Oh God, I pray tonight that there's nobody hiding, duking under the snow and ice of formality, hypocrisy, false professions. For Lord, one day one day, Lord, Thou will do as you did with the fig leaves on our first sinners. You will remove them. Lord, I pray that you remove tonight the coverings, the veils, the things that we have over, even us as believers, Lord, the bluffing, The fooling, the wasting of time, make us conscious, we pray, that before this night's out, that we're at the judgment seat, given an account from the very moment you saved us. Oh God. Father, Bless thy word. Speak to hearts. Part us in thy fear. And with thy blessing. For Christ's sake. Amen.